Um, so just for those of you guys who, who did have issues with it, um, this is what I was, what I was looking for is anytime you want to put something in an essay question, if you just go to embed image, if you're on a, um, either a Mac or a PC, if you're on a, a actual computer, if you're on your phone, I don't know what it looks like. I should look into that. Um, but if you just put embed image, it will give you um this option and you can either link to something if you have it uploaded somewhere else like if you have it on google drive or something like that you can put a link to your the google drive file um or if you just click canvas here and just either let's see for students i don't think you have course files i think you just have my files um so you just click that and hit upload file um and it'll just and then you can just pick whatever wonder what that one is. I know what that one is. I won't upload a random file that I don't know what it is just to make a point here. Um, and then it, it looks like this. Um, and then when you hit submit, like I said, when I go to grade it, it shows up like this in the browser, which helps me. So um, I thought we talked about that here, but that must have been my my Gen Chem class. Gen Chem, it makes more of a difference because there's 40 of them. Um, there's only nine of you guys, so I was I'm not as worried about um, you guys doing that. Um, hey Sean, I, mean, I know I, talk, I talked to you the other day about it too, but uh, I just did it with my phone and, and it worked pretty well. I could even just take a picture and it just worked, oh, okay. it uploaded directly. So, and you you hit the embed image button. Or no, something I think like yeah, I think it was either the M, M, uh, embedded image. I think that's what it was. Um, that or the media file, but one of them, yeah, it was, it linked me to canvas. Like the second option was canvas and it just said upload file. And I was using okay. my phone. So I was able to take a picture and it, cool. I think it worked. Um, yeah, I, all, all of you guys who, who didn't get it uploaded properly for the most part, you guys picked the correct workaround, which is like, I don't know what I'm doing and I want to make sure I get my file submitted. So I'm just going to email it to you. Um, which again, when I have 40 students in a class, that's a, that's a huge headache trying to keep track of all of that. But with only, with only nine of you guys, it was not as big of a deal. Um, but yeah, so if I, I think I'll just, since we're used to, you guys are used to the file uploads, I'll go back to that. I'm just out of habit. I put it as the essay questions, um, for this one. And since I was writing last week, I was writing new questions as opposed to using last year's questions. So. I, uh, I changed the format. So I'll, I think we'll just go back to doing the file uploads for you guys though. Um, so let's go ahead and start going in. Um, I get, you guys had some good quiz questions this week, good random questions and some good applicable questions. Um, this is the, somebody submitted a recipe for cookies that turn green when you bake them. They're are they gluten-free, was, was, uh, was that it? Um, keto, they're keto cookies. These keto cookies, when you bake them, turn green. Um, and that has to do with this compound called chlorogenic acid, which doesn't actually have any chlorine in it. It comes from the original Greek um, word chloro, which means green. Chlorogenic means green, the source of green, like genic, like Genesis. Um, and so chlorogenic acid is a compound that when you, so I'll pull up the structure here. Um, chlorogenic acid, when you heat it in an alkaline environment, when it's in an alkaline environment, that means basic, right? So basic means it's gonna deprotonate this acid group. When you have a deprotonated acid group and you heat it, you just have a CO2 with a negative charge, right? And so you can actually just turn this into a CO2 molecule. You can decarboxylate it um, and then form a new ketone right here instead. And so it's a slight small oxidation reaction that actually turns it to a different compound that's green. Um, so that absolutely has to do with, with the OCHEM. Um, and it's almost certainly, I couldn't find any details on the mechanism, but but acid groups, when you heat them, decarboxylate. 
Um, and I found one other source that says it's an oxidation reaction that turns it green, which means it's probably turning that alcohol into a ketone, which would be considered an oxidation because you're adding a carbon oxygen bond. Um, and from the point of view of organic compounds, that's, that's an oxidation reaction. So that one was fun. I hadn't seen that before. Um, and then a couple other people asked about what happens when you have multiple drugs at once. Um, why is that such a big deal? Um, there are a couple things that can happen. Generally speaking, it's not because the two drugs are going to interact with each other and make something new. Um, that, that is kind of the exception. That only happens in a couple different places, um, one of which is alcohol and Tylenol. Al ethanol and acetaminophen, when you take them both at the same time, they react together to make a compound that's really, really toxic to your liver. Um, so you should never take Advil, or sorry, you should never take Tylenol. And um, if you've been drinking, even if you've just had one drink, get it all the alcohol out of your system before you take any Tylenol. If you need to take some, um, some sort of pain medication and, and you've been drinking, stick to Advil. Advil, and that's kind of bad for your stomach, but not nearly as bad as Tylenol and ethanol. Um, and there are a couple of other instances um, where you get different compounds, different that where they react to make something else. Um, but for the most part, it has to do with when they have different mechanisms that sort of complement each other. So for instance, if you have one drug that causes the release of a whole bunch of serotonin and you have another drug that causes um, the breakdown of serotonin to be much slower, that can cause a lot of issues because um, for instance, so most hallucinogens are big serotonin releasers um, and a lot of antidepressants um, block the, are their serotonin reuptake inhibitors or they are, if you take MAOIs, are, stands for monoamine oxidase inhibitors, um, and which is the, the enzyme that breaks down serotonin and dopamine and um, adrenaline and noradrenaline. So if you, have, if you have something that releases a whole bunch of a monoamine, like dopamine or serotonin, and you're also taking MAOIs, you can wind up with the, the duration of that lasting a lot longer than um, might be recreationally um, pleasant. Um, instead of a five to five to eight hour acid trip, you could wind up with an acid trip that lasts 48 hours. Um, so there are definitely, definitely things, um, interactions, but it's not usually the drugs interacting with each other. It's when the mechanisms complement each other. Um, and that's the one time where I actually don't mind the use of the word synergy. Um, usually business buzzwords are, are pain. I don't like talking about business buzzwords, but they actually do use synergy um, in a scientific standpoint to mean when, when two drug effects or mechanisms work together to make things much more intense or much longer lasting. That's how they make ayahuasca, right? I believe if you're, if you, Either ayahuasca either has an MAOI in it, or when you make and when you make the make a tea with ayahuasca root, it extracts some of that MAOI with it. Because if you, the main hallucinatory compound in ayahuasca is DMT, and if you take DMT orally, normally your body just deactivates it so quickly that you don't feel any effects. But if you take it with an MAOI, you can take DMT orally, um, and that and it will last longer. Um, yeah, I think a lot of times the MAOI they use is harmaline or harmala. They add it to the to the tea. Yeah, that's the source of the MAOI a lot of times. Yeah, and um, I think poppy seeds actually have an MAO, MAOI that's naturally occurring as well. Um, something along those lines. Um, but yeah, there's there are lots of way, places where we see stuff like that happening. It's it's definitely interesting. Um, and then the book talks about mustard gas, which is not technically a gas, it's an aerosolized um, oil. Um, so they call it the more correct name would be sulfur mustard. Um, and what almost all chemical chemical weapons are designed around um, is they're, they're an oil that's mostly nonpolar, um, 
but generally speaking, it's something that when it comes into contact with water or a buffered solution, it'll go through an acid base reaction and become water soluble. Um, and so, so in a way that's kind of similar to the chlorogenic acid that we were looking at earlier. Um, and so, so water is absolutely part of that. Um, they're not currently designing new chemical weapons because, you know, they're weapons of mass destruction and, and, you know, horrible things in general. Um, but that's definitely, it's from the very beginning from World War One when they first started using chemical weapons, um, you know, designing things or using molecules that attack mucous membranes because that's where the water is exposed to the air um, is was has always been sort of the, the route of administration for chemical weapons. So it's the eyes, the throat, nose, lungs. Um, and usually what's going to happen is an acid base reaction because that's going to make it you're either going to protonate or deprotonate. Either way, you're going to make it charged, which increases its solubility in water. Um, because those oils are a lot easier to aerosolize than a white powder, which is what you get if you take almost any organic molecule and turn it into an ionic compound. You're going to get a white powder that's not easily dispersed the same way. Um, I think the exception being anthrax. Um, On to topics that are that are relevant to what we're going to go over here. Let me hang on, let me rearrange real quick. Um, you guys did all right on the quiz. Um, although there were some issues. <clears throat> um, when we look at the isomers of C4H9Cl and rank them in order of reactivity, our isomers um, looked like we had one chlorobutane, two chlorobutane, one chloromethylpropane, and Two chloro methylpropane. Um, the mistake that it that it seemed that a lot of people made looking at this reactivity is um, they tended to you guys tended to group these two isomers together and these two isomers together when really what we should be looking at is primary, secondary, or tertiary. Where is the chlorine? So it doesn't matter that this has a tertiary carbon if the chlorine is primary. So when it comes to the SN, SN2, primary went fastest. If we're looking, if we're comparing, these two are going to be close to the same. The linear molecule is going to be a little bit faster. Why is that, Sean? Um, just because an isopropyl group takes up more space, if you think about this whole section of the molecule as being an Spinach. isopropyl group, it's a little bit bigger than and bulkier than if you have a propyl group because you have two carbons attached right here that's just physically going to obscure more of this carbon. Um, but if you ranked them as being the same, I gave full credit for that. Um, because the main thing is that they're both primary chlorines. The chlorines are both on primary carbons. And then it would be, then our, our secondary chlorine and then our tertiary carbon would be the slowest for an SN2 reaction. Uh, and then it's going to go the exact opposite for SN1. SN1, we needed the leaving group to leave, which means we needed a stable, um, a stable carbocation when the chloride leaves. So tertiary, then secondary, and then the two primaries are going to be pretty much the same again. Um, if you were really splitting hairs, it would be this one would be a little bit faster because it could go through a rearrangement to make a tertiary carbocation. 
but the rearrangement matters less than the fact that the chlorine starts on a primary carbon. All right, so um, you guys, it's especially when you're writing these isomers and then trying to rank them, um, everybody tended to group them. Oh, that's, that's the butane, that's butane. Those two are going to be right next to each other. These are the two methyl propanes. They're going to be right next to each other. Um, but that's once you have these isomers drawn, forget about that and just look at where is the chlorine. Um, let's see, go back here. Um, as far as the intermediate for cis one chloro two methyl cyclohexane. So cyclohexane, cis, one chloro, two methyl. Um, and technically there would be two stereoisomers of this. There'd be the, the cis that was R, RS and the cis that was SR. Um, but I would, well, I wasn't getting specific on that one, um, because mainly we were looking at what the intermediate was and almost all of you guys correctly identified that the intermediate for an SN1 is going to look like chlorine leaves. And we put, we have a positive charge on that carbon. What you guys missed is that the intermediate that's going to actually be predominant is going to be the one where you has gone through a rearrangement. As soon as that chlorine leaves, you're gonna make this for a split second, and then it's gonna to switch to being, you're gonna move over the hydrogen, move that over to give yourself a tertiary carbocation. So it, it will do this for a second, and so, so I only took off half a point um, if you left it here, but what I was looking for was that molecule, which then is planar, not doesn't have any stereochemistry at that point. Yeah, I always forget about that hydrogen shift thing. I was looking for double bonds, like, oh, I forget how to rearrange this without five bonds. Yeah, it's, um, that's part of the part of the point I was trying to make is to remind you guys to always be watching for those rearrangements. If it goes through a carbocation intermediate, you always have to watch for that. All right. And then question three. Um, you guys, for the most part, identified the proper reaction here. Um, I didn't get a good explanation from very many of you because most of you just said, well, iodine's a better nucleophile than chlorine, chloride. Um, but that's not always the case. Iodide is only a better nucleophile if you're in a protic solvent. And so the fact that this was being done in ethanol as your solvent is what made iodide the better nucleophile. If you're in a, in a polar or a protic solvent, then the chloride is actually the stronger base. And so the chloride will actually be a better nucleophile if you're in a protic solvent, a protic solvent, excuse me. If you're in a polar protic solvent like ethanol, like water, anything with an OH group on it is going to be a protic solvent. Then it goes with which what with whatever is biggest, basically. Especially when we're talking about these halides. Um, and so, again, I didn't didn't take off too many points just for if you just said that iodide was a better nucleophile. But what I was looking for was some explanation of the fact that it was in ethanol made iodide a better nucleophile. Uh, 
Any questions on that? I wasn't even thinking the strength of the nucleophile. I was thinking the strength of the hydrogen bond that formed in the that would form in the product solvent. Right. And so that's that's exactly that what leads to iodide being the better nucleophile is the fact that you can have um, that iodide is not as stabilized as chloride is when you're in a protic solvent. And a protic solvent that has a strong partial positive on, on a hydrogen, so anything with an OH group, that strong partial positive is going to be able to surround a negative charge and stabilize it to the point where it's not very good at being a nucleophile. And it's best at doing that to small um, halides. So the chloride is more stabilized by the protic solvent than the iodide is because the chloride is smaller, which means iodide all of a sudden becomes the better nucleophile because iodide is not as stabilized. Right, that was that, that graph that we looked at where we said, okay, if we pick the right solvent, we can stabilize the transition state in the product. We said, okay, if we have if we have energy versus reaction, and this is our normal curve, if we can stabilize the transition state and the product without stabilizing the reactant as much, then we would get a surface that looks like that much smaller activation energy, much further downhill in energy. And so that's what we did with that protic solvent is we stabilized our transition state, which is charged. We stabilized our product. We didn't stabilize our reactant as much because it was that larger iodide that can't form as favorable bonds with the, with the ethanol molecules. And just a, a reminder in case, since we're still learning um, how we write these things, ET, and when it's written like it's an atomic symbol, um, is the OCHEM shorthand for ethyl, an ethyl group. ME, capital M, lowercase e, is the shorthand for a methyl. Instead of writing CH3, it doesn't save you that much if it's a methyl, but for ethyl, it can be you know, advantageous to write it that way. Um, we don't really write anything larger than ethyl groups that way. Um, occasionally you might see PR for propyl, but pro when you get to a propyl group, then you have to be specific, is it isopropyl or is it is it a straight chain propyl and things like that. So um, you really only see it with methyls and ethyls. But if you were wondering what the heck that was, that's an ethyl group with an OH on it, so ethanol. Um, relevant questions as to the quiz stuff. Why does the least bulky group lead to to be more being more reactive as in SN2? Um, that's remember SN2, you have to have your nucleophile has to be able to get in there and have access to the active carbon. And big groups around the active carbon, and the active carbon is the carbon with the halide on it with whatever's going through the being replaced in the substitution, um, the bigger groups around that just physically obstruct that active carbon. So your nucleophile can't get in there as well. Right? Especially the larger your nucleophile gets, the more that matters, right? Because you have to have physically have more space to get to that active carbon. Um, and somebody asked for clarification on how substitution reactions and acid base, base reactions are can be, I just said this, the relationship between them. Um, so an, a substitution reaction, if we talk about it in terms of our four mechanism patterns, we had nucleophile attack, leaving group leaves, proton transfer, and rearrangement were our four basic patterns, right? 
nucleophilic attack and leaving group leaves is what a substitution reaction is. If it happens all at once, it's SN2. If your leaving group leaves and then your subs and then your nucleophile comes in, then it's an SN1. Um, and an acid base reaction is it really is close to the same thing, except our leaving group, our nucleophile is attacking an H plus. It's wrong button. So if we look at and say hydroxide is our um, is our nucleophile for an for a substitution reaction, this is going to look like let me make it bigger. You're going to have your nucleophilic attack and your leaving group leaves. If we have the same thing happen with an acid in an acid base reaction, let's say it's uh, we've got an NH3 group attached to something, you're still going to have a nucleophilic attack, but the target is going to be an H plus. And the H plus is also your leaving group. So it's similar steps. You still have a nucleophilic attack in a leaving group leaving. It's just that your leaving group is the same as your target for the nucleophilic attack. And it's always going to be a hydrogen. All right, John, so actually, I have a little question. Because mm -hmm. uh, usually for, the, for that one, you're drawing the electrons towards the hydrogen. Uh, would that be proper or because I know it's nucleophilic, but. Would... So we're always drawing the the electrons moving towards a positive charge. So in this case right. for proton transfer, the target, the electrons are always going to be moving towards an H plus. Right. OK. Yeah, never mind. I see it now. Uh... And also just show off my daughter's awesome Dungeons and Dragons artwork here that we put up over here. Ah, everything's backwards. It's her goblin shaman that she colored. She asks for coloring pages of, um, of Dungeons and Dragons things now. And she colored that goblin and named him Tubbs. I have no idea why she named the goblin Tubbs, but I have Tubbs the goblin shaman next to my whiteboard now. I like it, man. I don't, Looks again, like tubs. Tub, yeah, he, I guess. Apparently, I don't. I don't fight it too much. I let them make up the names. All right. So, quick review where we were. Reactivity, we already covered that a little bit talking about the quiz question. For SN2 reactions, a methyl is always going to be faster than primary, always faster than secondary, always faster than tertiary. You can get a little bit of a gray area with SN1 reactions if you have some resonance that can happen. So if you have a secondary a secondary carbocation that's resonant stabilized is about as stable as a tertiary carbocation. So there's a little bit of wiggle room when resonance gets involved here. But in general for SN1, SN2 resonance doesn't make as much of a difference because we don't make it on the ionic intermediate, right? For SN2, it's going all at once. And I'm gonna try to avoid using in one step because that confuses one and two. I'm gonna say all at once is SN2 because it's second order. Um, SN1 gets a little bit hazy because of that charge intermediate and resonance can stabilize it. If you can have resonance stabilization, then that can, it's not quite as clear cut. But in general, SN1 is going to go the exact opposite of SN2. SN1 is tertiary will react faster than secondary, which will react faster than primary, faster than methyl. Solvents, the, the bullet points here is if a reactant 
in the or the product of the rate determining step is charged sorry if the reactant in the rate determining step is charged more polar solvents lead to a slower reaction because if it's if your reactants are charged that means that in a polar solvent you're going to stabilize those reactants more right and if you're stabilizing the reactants that means you're going to have more of a barrier to get over that transition state if the reactants are neutral more polar solvents lead to a faster reaction because instead of stabilizing the reactants, you're stabilizing either the transition state or the intermediate. So SN1 reactions, we're going to have, we're making charged intermediates, right? First step, the rate determining step is leaving group leaves. And then you're gonna wind up with a negative charge on your leaving group and a positive carbocation, both of which are stabilized in a more polar solvent. So if we do if we do the reactions in a polar solvent, we're going to favor SN1. That mechanism will be more common than SN2. Because in SN2, we're not making that charged intermediate. And typically, if it's SN2, we need a strong nucleophile. And most strong nucleophiles have a negative charge on them. So if it's in a polar aprotic solvent or a nonpolar solvent, we're going to favor SN2. If it's in a protic solvent, we're going to favor SN1. And that's really going to come down to when we have something that's sort of in the middle, mostly for secondary carbons. If it's a tertiary carbon, it's never going to go SN2. If it's a primary carbon, it's never going to go SN1. But if it's no, secondary, go ahead, yeah. Adam. I was just going to ask if is if that's possible at all. Like, could you ever get it to a state? Like, can you get it so polar that uh, SN one on a on a, a methyl happens? So if it's re if it not on a methyl, probably. But if it's resonance stabilized primary carbon, um, then you could in theory have SN one reaction happen. It's it's mainly it's going to be a when I say it, it's only going to go one of these routes, it just means that's the dominant one. It doesn't mean the other one's not happening. It's just happening at a much slower rate. And so the really the real question would be if it's a primary carbon, could we get it? Could we make the SN2 slow enough that the SN1 took over? Right. Or speed mm -hmm. up the SN1 somehow. So resonance would be one way to do that. But in general, if you're you're going to wind up with the fact that they, the SN2 is just gonna be so much faster that it's gonna be kind of hard to overcome that. And- Yeah, no, I see. So it's basically, you'd have to counter both, uh, no, what's it called, not, not normals, but you know, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. You have to do both. You have to speed up one and slow down the other all at the same time. Exactly. And that's, that's hard to do because normally the way that we speed up a reaction is we increase the temperature, but that speeds up everything. Yeah, cool, thanks. All right, so this is um, the similar figures to what I was just drawing. If we wind up looking at S, this, so this would be for um, SN2 reactions. If the reactants are more highly charged, then if we put it in a more polar solvent, we're going to stabilize those reactants more. So we wind up if if we consider the blue one to be our standard, if we, and then put it in a more polar solvent, we're going to stabilize everything a little bit when we put it in a more more polar solvent. But if we stabilize the reactants more than the transition state, or more than the reactants, that's going to that's going to slow this reaction down. Versus if we are making if your reactants have less charge than putting it into a more polar solvent, you, we can stabilize the products more than the reactants and change, we can change the equilibrium constant here, right? Because 
delta G, our energy here, is what factors into figuring out our equilibrium constant. So just so changing the solvent actually doesn't just can speed up one mechanism versus the other. You can actually change the equilibrium constant as well to get better yields if you choose your solvent carefully. Um, for SN1 reactions, we're making a charged intermediate every single time. The rate determining step is making a charged intermediate, which means more polar solvents are pretty much always going to favor SN1, right? This is just a graphical way of showing what we were just talking about. If it's SN1, this gets even lower because you're making a charged intermediate, which will then react with a nucleophile. So in summary, it's a good summary slide here. SN2 reactions are favored if you have a strong, if you have strong negatively charged nucleophiles in an aprotic solvent. If you have strong neutral nucleophiles in a protic solvent, there weren't that many strong neutral nucleophiles though. So this is less common. If you have less substituted active carbons, so methyl or primary specifically, or if you have bad leaving groups. Remember leaving groups where we use the analogy of, um, of the, the nucleophile is the person who's waiting for the open seating bar top table to open up. A strong nucleophile is the person goes over there and asks them if they're done and if they can leave so, so that you can have their table. And a weak nucleophile waits for them to leave first. If you have a poor leaving group, that's that group who pays their, pays their tab, finishes their drinks, and still just sits around chatting after they've, everything else is ready to go, right? They're just not leaving unless something comes in and prompts them to leave. SN1 reactions are favored if you have weak nucleophiles because they're not strong enough to come in and push the, the leaving group out. You have more substituted active carbons because that's going to make more stable, um, more stable carbocation intermediates. If you have any res resonance stabilization, if you have any resonance, that's going to make it so that the your carbocation is going to be stabilized. And then if you have good leaving groups, if your leaving groups can leave really easily, that's going to favor SN1 because they don't need a nucleophile to come in and push them out. They're good at leaving. Um, those those groups of people that have, um, I don't know if this is a thing other places in the US, but in Minnesota, they have um, my what uh, my wife and I call the Minnesota goodbye. I, we've noticed all my in-laws do this um, from Minnesota where they you have to say goodbye three times before you can actually hang up the phone or you know leave the house. Um, those would be bad leaving groups. Those are gonna favor SN2. Good leaving groups say goodbye once and peace. Valence would like you guys to acknowledge that she's saying hi to you without interrupting. All right. So go Valence, good and job on your drawing. They like your drawing of tubs. Thank you. All right. So let's let's do some practice here. Nine times out of 10 S SN1, one step reactions, we're going to lead to making some of the same product as the SN2 usually. But if it's a if it's an SN1, you're going to make a mess of other stuff too. You're going to make more than one stereoisomer if there's a possibility. You've got rearrangement that can happen, which can't happen if it's SN2. 
when we bring in, if you have other nucleophiles that could react around, those other nucleophiles can get in there and wind up making other products that you weren't intending. Um, so SN1 usually is going to result in a bunch of products. It's also more likely to go through elimination reactions and make an alkene, which we'll talk about later today. Um, so usually SN2 is actually is the simpler mechanism because it's one step and it also makes fewer products. So if we're trying to decide what mechanism something's going to go through, we look for what the solvent is. We look at, is it primary, secondary, tertiary? And we look at what our nucleophile is. So for this first example, we have DMF, which if you don't remember what it stands for, that's fine. We, you want to, we do want to remember it's a non, it's a polar aprotic solvent. And our nucleophile, if we look at what the other reactant is, we've got sodium cyanide. So what's our nucleophile? Cyanide. Cyanide. Anion. cyanide, it's the negative charge, right? Anytime you've got something written as an ionic compound with its polyatomic ion, usually the negative ion is going to be your nucleophile or some version of it, depending, it might be protonated or it might be, you know, this or that, but it's going to be some form of that. The sodium ions don't really make a difference. They're just there to balance the charge out because we can't add cyanide on its own. So if cyanide is our reactant, or is our, yeah, is our nucleophile, let's see. And we have bromine right here. First off, which mechanism we're going to go through? Do we have a strong nucleophile? Do we have a negatively charged nucleophile? The easiest way to tell if it's going to be a good nucleophile or not is to look at the charge. If it's got a negative charge and it's something, if it's something that's a weak base, then it's going to be a pretty good nucleophile. The stronger the base is, the, the better. But let me go back to the chart here. Um, our conjugate base, here's cyanide all the way down here. Cyanide ion is a weak base. When you put it in water, it'll steal protons from water to become cyanic acid. Remember that there were only six strong acids, right? And so if you have anything else with a negative charge that's not where the conjugate acid is not one of those six strong acids, it's going to be a pretty decent nucleophile. So remember, our six strong acids were hydrochloric, hydrobromic, hydroiodic, sulfuric, and sulfuric, perchloric, and what's the last one I'm not thinking about right now? Oh, nitric. Um, those conjugate bases, you'll notice those are all up here. Iodide, bromide, chloride. Hydrogen sulfate is the conjugate base of sulfuric acid. They all have negative pKa's. Nitric acid would be around negative 9. Um, perchloric would be around negative 10. So those are going to be not very strong nucleophiles. Anything where the where you've got a negative pKa, it's not going to be a very strong nucleophile. Anything else with a negative charge, though, is a pretty good nucleophile. So fluoride is a pretty good nucleophile. Cyanide is a pretty good nucleophile. Ammonia is a pretty good nucleophile. So we have a relatively strong relatively strong nucleophile in cyanide within the um, Lewis dot structure is just going to look like this for cyanide carbon triple bonded to a nitrogen negative charge on the carbon so you've got a lone pair on the carbon side you also have a lone pair on the nitrogen side which don't have a negative charge on that so Aprotic solvent, strong nucleophile, second good leaving group in bromine, all point to SN2. 
And if we wanted to draw the mechanism, we would draw the lone pair here. Coming in and attaching, but we have to make room for it. So the bromine leaves, takes the electrons with it. So our, so technically we actually have two possible nucleophiles here. You can have the carbon end of the of the cyanide can come in and attach. Technically the nitrogen side could come in and attach too, but then you wind up with a carbon with three bonds and a nitrogen with four which is usually not as stable as the reverse. We have a choice to make carbon with four bonds and nitrogen with three. The, that lowers the formal charge for everything, right? Or gets it closer to zero. So the carbon end of the cyanide is going to attach. Bromine leaves. If it's SN2, we're only going to make one product, which is going to look like something like that. There's the carbon from the cyanide that came in and attached. There's the nitrogen that's still attached as well. It's going to be into the board or the green because the bromide was coming towards us, right? We had to do that backside attack for SN2. So we only get one product here. It all happens at once, no rearrangement necessary. No, you're not gonna get more than one possible stereoisomer. Right, so in general, SN2 is preferable both in the lab, if you're trying to do a synthesis, SN2 is preferable because you only make one product. And on paper and in this class, SN2 is preferable because it's simpler. It's easier. There's fewer things you guys need to pay attention to. We didn't even have to think about rearrangements, right? And that'll be a common theme in lab is we'll see how do we, we are almost always gonna be using a polar aprotic solvent for synthesis reactions because we're trying to limit the number of possible products we can make. If we use water as our solvent, one that's gonna favor SN1. Yeah, go get it, it's in the drawer over there. Um, one, it's going to, you're going to not going to have only a single stereoisomer. You're going to have both stereoisomers Two, If we did this in water, water is itself a nucleophile. If water is a nucleophile itself, then you have to deal with the fact that water can get in there and replace the bromine and some of these molecules too. You now cyanide is a better nucleophile than water is. So you're going to get mostly the cyanide substitution, but you're going to get some of the, of the OH coming in and substituting as well, right? So remember, the, remember my favorite definition, especially for OCHEM of, of what chemistry, how do I know which mechanisms are happening? Well, anything that can happen does happen. So the more we can limit the possibilities, the simpler things get and the better our yields will get. All right, let's finish these two and then we'll take our break. Sorry, we have a traffic jam in the office door. Dog can't decide if she wants to be in here with me or out with Valence. All right. So for this second one, we have this happening in water. Polar aprotic salt. Oh, now you're going to come in or up too? This is just that kind of morning, I guess. It's cold. Everybody wants attention. Go to bed. All right, so if it's in water, that's a protic solvent, right? Which favors SN1. We've still got bromide, which is a pretty good leaving group, also favors SN1. And the fact that our nucleophile is gonna be the oxygen on the water. We don't have a super strong nucleophile. It's an okay nucleophile. But if you look at this chart here, H2O is all the way at the top, not all the way at the top. 
if we if this was under basic conditions and our nucleophile was hydroxide that's a much stronger nucleophile then we would have to consider okay maybe some of it's going to go sn1 some of it's going to go sn2 the fact that it's water as our nucleophile tells us that it's going to be a predominantly sn1 so what is our if and if it's sn1 the first step is look at what your intermediate is going to look like and can it rearrange in this case not really right if I clear this, we're going to, our intermediate is going to look like this, right? So two carbons away from the two methyl groups, we had our leaving group leaves, leaves a part, a positive charge there. If you wanted to show the whole structure, there's also a hydrogen still attached there after the bromide leaves, right? But there's no carbon next door that could rearrange to give, make it a tertiary carbocation. So it's just going to stay like this. You won't go through two. You won't go through two steps of rearrangement unless it's something like primary goes to secondary and then secondary could go to tertiary. You'll never see a secondary goes to secondary on its way to, to a tertiary. Right, that having two steps where one of them is not significantly downhill, it would be we'd be making something that was just as stable, not any more stable, means we're not going to see that happen in real life. So that means that our product then we're going to get both stereoisomers of the product. Water will come in here. The first step will look like oxygen attaches and still has both of the hydrogens attached. But then you can wind up with a quick acid or a quick proton transfer to turn that into um, an alcohol, an OH group. So this would be right when the nucleophile comes in. This is more stable than it was, right? Because at least you still have a positive charge on the oxygen, but at least everything has a full valence. And then if you have water around, you still have water molecules around, or if you have bromide around, you have something that can act as a base. And you can come in here and attack that proton, oxygen keeps the electrons. And so you actually wind up with a three-step reaction in this case. Or the, but the last step is just going to be deprotonating your first product. If you just left it like this, um, on a test, that's going to be most of the, especially if it was a closed book test, this would be almost all of the credit. Um, generally speaking, though, we're going to want to make sure we rearrange things to get to our final stabilized um, product, which would be, we don't want anything with a formal charge if we can help it. So the best answer here would be this molecule. All right, and- So is that notice final proton transfer step always gonna happen with water? basically because water can act as a base right and if we go back to this chart um most of these protonated alcohols like this would be methanol that's been protonated that's a stronger acid than hydronium is not by a lot but by enough that if water is around you're always going to protonate water over having a protonated alcohol is that's that's just going to be more stable in general and since this is an o, this is an ochem class we care more about the organic side of things we're always going to just try to rearrange the organic molecule to be as stable as possible um usually because that's our limiting reactant we don't have as much of it so if there's a whole bunch of water around and there's only a little bit of our protonated alcohol around that protonated alcohol we have a lot of reactants that we can basically get rid of that h plus 
Um, but yeah, un unless I say it's under really acidic conditions or something like that, that's usually, we're usually going to wind up with a neutral molecule at the end. All right. We've got more practice with these. Um, we'll come back in 10 minutes, come back at 10 after nine, and we'll do these three because this brings some resonance in and we'll talk about resonance and how that affects things a little bit. And then we'll get into elimination reactions. All right, I'll see you in 10.
All right, let's take a look at some of these other examples here. Uh, the last example on this page, on the, the first page of practice, and the first example on the second slide um, have the same reactant. All that's changed is the nucleophile and the solvent. Um, and so, although I said we were going to skip these to get to the ones where resonance played a bigger role, um, might be worth remembering. So in this case, if we have, um, if you have two, two molecules that are both used as solvents, um, but one of them is acting as a reactant and the other one is acting as the solvent, you will frequently see them pulled out like this, where you have methanol here written separately as a reactant versus DMSO, which was a aprotic solvent. Um, versus if you just, if you have something where one of the compounds is, is very definitely not a solvent, you will frequently see it written like this, like the, the si sodium cyanide example at the top. Um, the sodium cyanide is a reactant, but it's written this way because it's non-organic and it's and really we're more interested in what's happening to this bigger molecule. Um, however, if you have something like methanol and DMSO, if we wrote both of those above and below the arrow, it'd be unclear which was the reactant and which one was the nucleophile. And so I'll try to make sure it's very clear if there's if there are two possible molecules that could be reactants or could could be the solvent. I'll try to make sure I make make it very clear um, in the problem statement which one is the reactant and which one is the um, the solvent. Um, and DMSO these aprotic solvents for the most part are going to be pretty inactive. The aprotic solvents don't tend to react very much. Um, and so if you if you know that DMSO is an aprotic solvent, we can usually write it off as be um, as being a solvent, not being um, a reactant. And if it was going to be a reactant, we probably would draw the structure, not just say DMSO. Um, and because we see that a lot with acetone. Acetone is a common solvent, but it's also um, a reactant in a lot of the reactions that we'll look at in the in the future. And so for acetone, if it's a reactant, we'll show the structure so that we can see what's going on. And if it's just acting as the solvent, we'll just write acetone or use an abbreviation like that. Um, in this case, for this example here, we've got methanol as our nucleophile, DMSO as our solvent. So aprotic solvent, um, which means it's not going to go SN1. Chloride's not a great leaving group. Methanol is kind of in the middle as far as how good of a, a nucleophile it is. Um, it's not a super strong nucleophile. And chloride is not the best leaving group. Realistically, we would probably have some amount of, of um, SN1 and SN2 happening in this case. They're going to be comparable as far as the reaction rates go. Um, but if we see an aprotic solvent in general, you should be thinking SN2, right? So single step reaction, well, kind of a single step reaction. Let's draw this one up out on the board um, because we are going to wind up with a proton transfer that has to happen at the end. Is that the right? Yeah. Our reaction is going to look like leaving group leaves. And I'll use this lone pair for the sake of showing backside attack. So after the SN2 step, our product is going to, or our, it would technically be an intermediate at that point. Chloride's gone. We replace it with the methanol, which is now going to be coming out towards us. Mm 
So our first step would look like that. Like we were mentioning before, though, if we have something that can act as a base and our primary product has a charge to it that we can we can do a little proton transfer, um, then then we're going to see that. And so we just need something that can act as a base, either the leaving group that just left or the methanol that's still that is floating around. Um, either way, it's commonly written just to make the reaction balance better. <laughs> If we just use the leaving group as the base. And so we would see the mechanism would then look like that. And so our overall product would be We would wind up with this ether group, which you could leave it written out like that. You could write it in skeletal form, which would just look like that. Um, and then I'm less concerned with writing plus HCl, but that would be the other part of this reaction, right? Is the is the leaving group and the proton that we lost together would be, we would write it as plus HCl usually or plus whatever your leaving group was. Um, see if I can make a good generalized statement. The easiest way to know what's going to get protonated when you do one of these is just your leaving group always has going to have a lone pair, even if it doesn't have a negative charge, right? Because when it leaves, it takes the electrons with it. So you can always use your leaving group as the base to do a proton transfer is the easiest way to remember it. All right, so whatever that leaving group was. So frequently, if it's a halide that's your leaving group, you're just going to make HCl or HBr or HI. It, that might not be representative of what's actually the most common, because really, this is a stronger acid than, than the um, protonated methanol. So if there's more methanol around, it'll protonate the methanol instead of the chloride. But that's going to be another equilibrium process that's happening on top of that. So just to simplify it, just always use your leaving group. Like I'm giving you guys tools to simplify something that's one of the more complicated systems that you guys have ever seen in chemistry, um, as though that makes it easy. If we That's the wrong. We look at the next example, same starting molecule, so same leaving group. Um, we have a different nucleophile. We have ammonia acting as our nucleophile, and it's in water. And again, in cases where you have two possible nucleophiles, the one that's written as a reactant is the one we will generally consider to be the nucleophile. If I write it like this, the water will also act as a nucleophile. But if I write it like this, I'm asking you to only look at the reaction where the ammonia is acting as the nucleophile. Unless I say something, uh, I will frequently on the on these tests say one of the problems. And now that you guys are good at doing constitutional isomers, I don't have to test you on that. So what I do instead is I say, okay, write every possible product for this molecule reacting with ammonia in water. And then so then you could have ammonia being the nucleophile going SN1, SN2, or you could have water being the nucleophile going SN1, SN2, which gives you a lot of possible products, right? Um, generally, if I write it like this in the reaction section, I'm only looking for a couple products. What are the SN, what's the dominant mechanism? And therefore, what are the major products? Um, so in this case, our the fact that we are in water tells us it's not going to be SN2. Ammonia is not that great of a nucleophile. 
doesn't have a negative charge and we're in a protic solvent tells us we should be looking SN2 or sorry SN1 leaving group leaves first which now all of a sudden means we need to take into account rearrangement right because our intermediate then would look like I'll go back to the board here Our intermediate looks like this, right? Which can go through a little rearrangement. So our more significant intermediate looks like that. And now ammonia can come in here and attach. Are we going to get more than one stereoisomer? It can attack from, if you think of this molecule as being flat, then the empty P orbital that the ammonia is going to attack can be up towards us or into the board. Is that going to give us two different products, though? Probably get a mixture of the two different stereoisomers, right? You would if this was an asymmetric center. We wind up with two identical substituents though, two ethyl groups that we can't tell the difference between. So that question wasn't, it was a bit of a trick question. I wasn't trying to trick you. I was trying to remind you that just because we started with stereochemistry doesn't mean we're gonna end with stereoisomers because our product is gonna look like this, that carbon has four things attached to it, but two of them are identical. The two ethyl groups are identical. And then from here, ideally, we, we would then show the last proton transfer, which would be your leaving group, grabbing one of these hydrogens, which I didn't write them all out, so it's hard to show that. Last proton transfer, so you get plus HCl, and you end up with a neutral nitrogen. And again, that, that step, in the case of, of um, an amine, a nitrogen, that last step probably won't happen. Because if you an amine is a weak base and HCl is a strong acid, if you have both of them there, it'll actually stop at the protonated form. And you'll wind up with the organic salt as your product. Because you'll wind up with a positive cation, which would be this whole thing where the positive charge was on nitrogen. And then you would have a negative charge on the chloride. And so anytime you see medication, if you look at the active ingredients and it says whatever hydrochloride, that's actually what you're looking at is it's an ionic compound where you have a protonated compound that has a positive charge, usually on a nitrogen. Um, and it's got the chloride added to balance the charge out. So if you look at Tylenol might be acetaminophen hydrochloride. Um, and that hydrochloride is just indicating that while we might write it like this to keep everything neutral, really what we have is a plus charge here and a negative charge there. All right, last. Where did, where did you guys go? I lost my Zoom window. There are advantages to having two monitors and having lots of things open at once, but it also means I lose my Zoom window occasionally. 
in the first week of classes, I was not paying attention to my office hours and somebody came into office hours and was sitting in office hours with me muted. Um, and I didn't even know they were there because I didn't realize I had my headphones plugged in too. So they just sat there and watched me work on my computer because I had my Zoom minimized. Um, so the last thing to consider here for now is if we have a reaction happening, this is another case where we can favor one mechanism versus the other just by changing our solvent. If we have methanol acting as our nucleophile in a polar aprotic solvent, that's gonna favor SN2, right? Which means an SN2 is our easy, our easy, I guess simple, er mechanism, more simple, where we're just gonna get the backside attack comes in here bromide leaves with the electrons and we'd get just the opposite stereoisomer where we wind up with our our ether attached in the downward position the going away position that nothing else changes though if we have the same molecule and so that product there would look like that right nothing changed position really we had that that hydrogen that was there did that light flip light switch flip where because the hydrogen was down into the board but then when your new nucleophile comes in and the bromine leaves you get that umbrella flip and some of the hydrogens pointing towards us and our nucleophile is pointed away and then i skipped drawing the um proton transfer step at the end so really this would be plus hbr right because the first step this would still have the h plus attached to it the second one though if it goes sn1 in addition to worrying about rearrangement sn1 resonance can play a role so this one is here mostly so I can remind you guys how resonance works. Because what is our intermediate in the case of, of this reaction, our leaving group has left and we're just left with a positive charge here, right? The, after the bromide's gone, <coughs> excuse me. This isn't going to go through a rearrangement, though, because rather than it can't move a hydrogen over from over here, because then we'd just be going from secondary to secondary. But it is resonance stabilized, which means there's another. Let's see how I can give myself space to do this. There's another intermediate, basically where so we move the electrons over this pi bond moves into the empty orbital over here so we make a new pi bond there and now we have a positive charge we took the electrons away from this carbon to do that so both of these are going to happen right and both of these can be attacked by a nucleophile to give you a product this this mechanism right here illustrates why I took the time to test you guys on the midterm on on which resonance structure is more important because which of these is more stable. Bottom one, right? Uh, bottom. Yeah, because the bottom one, they're they're both happening at the same time, but the bottom one you get a positive charge on a tertiary carbon. The top resonance structure you get a positive charge on a secondary. So it's not truly a rearrangement. Resonance is not a rearrangement, but it can have a similar effect in that it, it changes what, what product we will get. Because 
maybe 80% of the time we'll wind up doing our addition reaction to that carbon. And we wind up with, this is our first step product. And then maybe 20% of the time, maybe even less, we wind up with the water adding up here. Um, and so then that would wind up looking like this. And then we'd go through our proton transfer step to make HBr and the OH group in those two positions. This would be the major product. And for full, for complete credit on this one, it's not just the major product just drawn like, I guess, let's, let me finish adding the, getting rid of the protons here. In both of these, these are asymmetric carbons now. So both of these possibilities are gonna have R and S. And so the way, if you're trying to draw the products on a test, the way you could write that would just be, you either draw them both or you could write R plus S next to these. If it's gonna be in equal amounts, which is what we would expect here. Cause these are, we have equal probability of that OH attacking from the top versus the bottom because this is a flat molecule. It probably wouldn't be exactly 50-50 because we all know how complicated the structure of cyclohexane or cyclohexene can be. It's not totally planar. And so there would be something that comes into account that looks at, well, maybe this side, maybe it might be 48% of the time it attacks from the top versus the bottom because of axial versus equatorial positions. But for the sake of, of this class right now, we would just say about 50-50, R versus S. And this is what we're gonna have the most of. So we'll have- So Sean, are you showing both resonance structures in your final answer? So if, if, if this is in the section where it just says, write the major product, then you don't need to show the resonance structures at all. The major product would just be this bottom one. And specifically, you would wanna say R versus S because this is the major product, but the major product has two stereoisomers that are both happening at the same time. So when it says the major product, usually that means one, but if you have two major products that happened roughly the same percentage of the time, you would wanna draw both of them. And then if it shows says draw all products, you would also wanna show these this one up here as well. Right, so, and again, sliding scale when it comes to this, like if you just did, if you just got this top one and you forgot that it could go through resonance, that's still going to be three out of four points or something like that, depending on how much the, the problem's worth. Right. If you remember the res or if you remembered the resonance, but forgot that you could get R versus S, then that's three and a half out of four points or three, three and three quarters points out of four. Right. So it's, I'm, what I'm mainly looking for is what, what is the overall net reaction and then some of the more specific stereochemistry stuff is, you know, to get that perfect score, you would want to draw, if it said draw the major product, you would want to draw this and then say R plus S or draw both versions of it with the OH up or, and the methyl down and then vice versa. This is usually a time saver to just say R plus S. Um, if I ask you for the mechanism or all possible products, then I'd want to see both of these. And if I ask for the mechanism, I want to see the, the intermediates, including the resonance. All right. So, and typically the way that both on my tests and on um, other, other chemistry, OCHEM classes, um, you'll have on a test, you would have, you know, two or three mechanisms and then like 10 
or 12 reactions where you don't have to draw the whole mechanism. All I want is the major product at the end. And then I'll ask you, and then I'll pick a couple of the mechanisms and say, show me the whole thing, including all the possible products. Right, but I'll, I stagger that so that it's not too too much in terms of uh, time time wise. All right, let's add another reaction in there because things aren't complicated enough. Um, the nice thing about these other reactions is that they're basically different versions of the same thing that we've already done. It's still going to be leaving group leaves and nucleophile attack. Um, if it's elimination reaction, though, instead of replacing a good leaving group with a nucleophile, you have your nucleophile act as a base and pull a hydrogen off of a carbon next door. And so what that actually gives us is you wind up making an alkene. You wind up making a carbon-carbon pi bond instead of just replacing your leaving group with a nucleophile. All right, so the net reactions don't look that same, but we'll see the mechanisms are very similar though. So the two types of elimination we see, so I, let's give some context here first. Um, we usually see elimination happening if you have alkyl halides and strong nucleophiles. And the alkyl halide part of it, those halides, they were good for substitution reactions because they were good leaving groups, right? If you have a strong nucleophile, that favored getting in there and attacking and pushing that leaving group off. But if it's a strong nucleophile, what else is it? And go back to this slide. Strong best base. nucleophiles, <laughs> exactly. The best nucleophiles were also good bases because they're not that stable on their own and they've got a negative charge or they're gonna they're seeking out positive charges. And so that sometimes that means the active carbon, but it can also mean seeking out an H plus. Um, and we'll see that there are two different versions of elimination. And we can kind of see this, a lot of similarities here, right? A first order elimination is the elimination equivalent of SN1. A second order elimination is like SN2, so happens all at once. Versus your leaving group leaves first, and then you have the elimination happening. Right, so this one is still going to go through a carbocation intermediate. That's supposed to be a plus, but my mouse did not go up and down properly. So you're going to go through a carbocation intermediate versus all at once. Right. The only difference is what is the target for the nucleophile? If the target for the nucleophile is a hydrogen, you get an elimination reaction. If the target for the nucleophile is the active carbon, you get substitution. So first order could make sense because we could make a carbocation intermediate. And then if our nucleophile pulls off a hydrogen, instead of hitting that positive charge, you could get an alkene. How could it really be second order? How could you have a elimination reaction happening all at once? I mean, go ahead, Cody. Oh, I'm losing my train of thought. I lost it. Okay, that's fine. Let's look at what it would look like. So if we have, so let's say we've got our chlorine up here and we've got hydrogen here, hydrogen here, 
unless let's just say we're looking at chloro chloroethane. And the most stable form of chloroethane, most stable conformer is going to look like this. Right, where you've got your hydrogen is in this hydrogens in the staggered position. So if we've got an elimination reaction, so if it was if it was SN2, we would have our, let's just say we've got OH as our um, as our nucleophile, the negative charge would be coming in here as the chloride leaves. Right? That would be the SN2 mechanism. If it's the elimination reaction, though, the chlorine leaving still doesn't change. It's still going to look the same way. And if it was E1, if it was the first order reaction, that would be this, it's the same first step for the elimination, the substitution, leaving group leaves. The difference, though, if we're going to have a elimination reaction, your nucleophile is going to act as a base instead. So it's going to, it's going to act as an acid base reaction, a proton transfer reaction, where the target for the nucleophile is the hydrogen instead of the active carbon. And that hydrogen can only have one bond, right? Can only have one pair of electrons to a hydrogen which means if the base pulls an H plus off, what happens to these electrons? They stay with the carbon. They stay with the carbon. And then you have a carbon with an extra pair of electrons next to a carbon that's missing a pair of electrons. Or more likely, it's all happening in one step. We just draw it like that. You wind up protonating your base your leaving group leaves and takes the electrons with it, and you make a new pi bond between the two carbons. So if this is happening all at once, if it's a second order reaction, this is what the mechanism is going to look like. If it was first order, if it was the E1, it's going to go through two steps where the first step, this doesn't happen right away. First step is just chlorine leaves and you get the carbocation. And then the other two arrows come into play, right? So again, same steps. The only thing that's going to be different about E1 versus E2 is does it happen all at once or does it go through an intermediate? So rather than continue, I thought my cat was outside, but that was just a squirrel running past my window. Um, rather than continuing on into the more complicated mechanism things, because we've done a lot of complicated mechanisms and, and variables in here, um, let's finish by doing something easier. We'll do nomenclature. Nomenclature for an alkene is actually really straightforward because we did the we did the work of learning how to name alkanes and halo alkanes. Our rules don't change that in, that much, it, but if it's an alkene instead of an alkane, we're just going to replace instead of ending in ane, we end it in ene. So instead of ethane, it's eth still means two carbons on our longest carbon chain. But instead of ethane, this is ethene. Instead of cyclohexane, this is cyclohexene. And so not not that different, not that complicated. 
like I said, I, I am, was being serious when I said we're going to end on something that's a little easier to feel, to feel confident about. What would this last one be? Butene. Be butene. Can there be more than one butene though? Is there one, more than one isomer of butene? That, yeah, that double bond can be in different places. And how do we, if we could have a methyl group in more than one place, how did we indicate where the methyl group was? Would it be like one, two, or would it just be one? That would make a lot of sense um, to say one, two butene because the bond is between carbons one and two. Um, it gets simplified though, because it always has to be, the bond always has to be between two adjacent carbons, right? So rather than say one, two butene, we just say one butene. Because if it's, if it's carbon one is in the pi bond, the second part has to be on carbon two. So it just saves us a syllable. Yes, yeah, so we have one butene or a two butene would be double bond between the middle two carbons. What about for the cyclohexene? So for cyclohexene, if we put the double bond over here instead, we would still just call that carbon one and carbon two, right? So it doesn't really make a difference. You don't have to have a number in front of cyclohexene because wherever the double bond is, that's carbon one and carbon two. Do you alkenes only have one double bond? Correct. If it was more than one double bond, it would be a diene. Makes sense, right? Um, and the naming those is a little bit different. Um, but the other, and the other way you can write this, that's kind of the new school way of doing it, but it doesn't roll off the tongue as well, would be but one ene. Um, but that, like I said, doesn't roll off the tongue as well. And it looks more awkward to write it as well. So either of those are, is acceptable. Um, if it was two, if it was a diene, you just, just like if you have dimethyl, you have this, you had to have two numbers to specify where each methyl group was, right? So if it was this molecule, This is still four carbons in a row. This would be butadiene. The ene is indicating the double bond. So we would just say, get text box over there. We just say one, three, butadiene. Technically the one is redundant, but that's when you have a diene, you always put both numbers in just for the sake of being consistent. Um, or buta one, three diene. If you want to put the numbers in the middle, keep the numbers right in front of the functional group that gives it its name. And we will go ahead and stop there for now. Perfect timing. We won't get into cis versus trans or E versus Z um, for alkenes today. We'll just leave it there and we'll start finishing up and doing some practice with nomenclature on Thursday. And then we'll get into writing out products for elimination reactions. Um, I don't have the assignment uploaded for today's lab yet. Um, it will have a little mini lecture at the beginning talking about IR spectroscopy and what that is and how to interpret it. Um, but today's lab is basically going to be practice um, interpreting. It's going to be like the GC lab where I give you data and you interpret it. Um, less math involved, less Excel. Um, and so I'm just going to give you tips and 
on how to interpret this information and why I would use it and where it comes from um, at the beginning of lab at one. So and I'll record that and post it as well, like usual. Um, and I'll have the assignment. So don't worry too much about getting ahead on the assignment, one, because it's not posted yet, and two, because I need to introduce it and give it some context first. All right. So I will see everybody at, sorry, I don't see you guys at one. I see you guys at 3.30. Uh, at 3.30. See you then. Thanks, Sean.